Let me begin by saying how very happy I am to be here, uh, to meet again with some old friends, uh, to put some uh, faces to the names of the things that I've been reading, and I look forward to uh, the discussions that uh, we can have uh, today and uh, tomorrow. And I'm particularly glad that I have a chance to present you some work in progress. I was told it was okay to be presenting work in progress, and it is very much work in progress. So I'm hoping in discussions with you to sort of find out um, where it doesn't seem very convincing, where I might need to steer in a different direction, or to learn about uh, aspects of this issue that some of you may be working on or know something about. So, very much looking forward to that. So let me uh, begin. So a couple, a couple of provocative questions to start off with. The first one, thinking about this global financial crisis, a crisis made by men. There's been quite a lot of um, newspaper articles uh, raising this issue. I picked out one of them. Uh, this was one that was in the Washington Post in February the 11th, 2009, headlined in Banking Crisis Guys Get the Blame, More Women Needed in Top Jobs, Critics Say. And it was about um, a meeting in London in February, February the 10th of the UK Parliamentary Treasury Select Committee calling before it uh, some of the key uh, people in who were running the British banks that had lost billions of dollars and it had to be bailed out. And as you can see, the, the, the quote lists the names of all the, the uh, people at that meeting. Um, the, first, uh, the first paragraph is the, the ones who were the, the, the people who ran the British banks. They were all guys, they're Fred, Tom, Andy, etc., etc., coming before a parliamentary committee, uh, which it, that parliamentary committee only had one woman on it, Sally, and so 18 people, in, uh, 19 people in the room, eight of the, 18 of them men. And I found several other articles may, raising this same issue, is this a crisis made by men? So that was one uh, provocative question to start off with. The second was, again, something that a uh, question raised a lot uh, by some people in the UK not long after uh, the financial crisis really hit, about this time last year, uh, a recession hitting women hardest. So this is an article by Ruth Sutherland, who's the business editor of the Observer Sunday newspaper in the UK, in one of the series broadsheet newspapers. Um, and she's had a whole series of articles about the gender dimensions of the crisis, and this was one of her early ones. Uh, the real victims in this credit crunch question mark women, uh, suggesting that uh, in this recession, unlike in previous ones, women may be hardest hit in terms of job losses, and raising the question, could this downturn Reserve the huge, uh, reverse the huge economic gains that women have made over the past decades. So these were the two questions I started off with because I found that these were being raised in the press. There were women parliamentarians along the same lines and some women's groups also uh, raising the same kind of questions, arguing along the same lines. Of course, being an academic, I thought, is it quite so simple as that? <coughs> And so I began to think about a framework for analysis, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about this. I, I, some, you, some people, to some people, it may look like a matrix. To me, it looks like a patchwork quilt, and a patchwork quilt that's still in process. Uh, so what you see there is deliberately I've got a lot of black squares uh, in it, and I'll be trying to attempt to fill in a little bit about some of these squares during the talk. But I began by thinking about uh, the nature of the crisis, thinking about the origins, the proximate, but also the, um, some of the underlying reasons for the crisis, the impacts, both in the short run, but also longer run impacts, and responses. And I'm going to focus on two kinds of responses, uh, households and states, although there are a range of other kinds of responses one might talk about as well in terms of uh, community or organized labor responses. And then uh, I thought of the three sectors that I wanted to talk about. Finance, obviously, because that's where things yet had started. 
production, what's the impact going to be on production, and social reproduction. And I've had a long sort of inner struggle about whether to use this label, social reproduction. I used it at a meeting in Oxford, organised by Oxfam at the beginning of last week. Then I had to spend 15 minutes trying to explain what I meant by social reproduction. Perhaps I don't need to spend as long in, the, in, in this group, uh, but I mean the, um, the non-market, unpaid activities that go on in households and communities, uh, that reproduce us as human beings and that also reproduce the labour supply uh, for production and for finance. And I guess I've called it social reproduction rather than households and communities um, for two reasons. I think one is, because, and it re reflects the reason I think why in feminist thinking we started to use this term. Uh, to get away from if used households and communities, people often think of that as a kind of private and as not part of the economy. And uh, so I think we wanted to say, well, uh, it has very public dimensions, even if it's not market and non-market. And um, we like to think of it as part of the economy in the sense that work goes on there, even though it's not market work, and it's work that's absolutely essential for the rest of the economy. Um, operating. But I'll be interested to hear anybody's comments on that. I'm going to give a talk in New York on Monday under the auspices of the United Nations Development Program. And there I might be labeled as <laughs> families and communities, but I'll, I'll be interested to see people's views on that. So that's the framework that I'm trying to work with. And I have not myself done any new field work at all. I've been looking at um, secondary sources, both um, quantitative and some qualitative sources, but really just trying to put it together and also to keep pace with the changing nature of the crisis. I also want to signal, of course, um, an awareness of intersections and diversities, although I'm not going to be going into a depth on any of these issues, but clearly uh, gender intersects with all of these other stratifiers, race, ethnicity, class, age, location. Uh, and if one were writing a, a book on this, one would want to go into these in a lot more detail. I guess I will be focusing quite a bit on the issues for lower income uh, women and men. Um, and my focus really, when I, saw, I realized I said high income, when push came to shove, I was really talking about Anglo-Saxon capitalism, um, UK, USA, and to some extent Ireland, where I was at the end of August talking with people. And the trajectory in, say, Germany and France uh, is a bit different. Um, uh, I haven't done any uh, work on Iceland, which also talked, it turns out to be suspiciously like Anglo-Saxon capitalism, although I never thought of that before. And there are some countries which are often classified as Anglo-Saxon capitalism, which have had a somewhat different trajectory, like Australia, where I spent three months in the summer. So that's something that might come up in discussion. Okay, so now I'm going to start on my patchwork quilt. And, uh, talk a little bit about the proximate origins in the financial sector, where I think more or less everybody knows what they think about that. It's all conventional wisdom, it's reckless bankers, it's regulatory and credit rating failures. And within that one, kind of course, raise the issue of the, the gender division of labor in finance, that issue again of who's been taking the decisions. And this is a quote from Nicholas Krustoff in the, in the New York Times, about a discussion that was had at the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, probably involving some of the people who'd actually been reckless bankers or responsible for the regulatory failures, um, talking about, well, would it have been different if Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Sisters or Lehman Brothers and Sisters? In other words, that same uh, idea that uh, the crisis, the proximate the so origins of the crisis are in a sector of the economy which is extraordinarily dominated by men, and which women have made less inroads than they have in many other sectors of the economy, the high-level decision-making positions, and in which the gender inequalities are still very much of a very egregious kind. 
There had just been a new report um, launched in London on gender inequality in the, the city of London. And the gender gap in earnings is bigger than any other sector of the economy. And um, the, the kind of practices that are not tolerated now in any other sector of the economy in terms of uh, sexual harassment, for instance, seem to be alive and well in the city of London. There have been several very high profile uh, sexual harassment suites brought by a suit brought by um, uh, women employed there. Uh, so uh, that might be one thing one might explore. Uh, clearly, it is a sector in which um, men have been uh, more, ex more, much more dominant in decision making in high level positions. But is is that enough? Just to point to that. Uh, another thing that people have talked about is gender norms. Uh, the kind of macho culture uh, that um, uh, seems to be uh, prevalent in, um, in the city of London, uh, in Wall Street, and in this case in, uh, in Iceland. Um, this is, uh, to illustrate this, this is another clip from Ruth Sutherland, um, the business correspondent, business editor of the Observer newspaper, writing in February this year. Um, arguing that the uh, Iceland's uh, financial disaster was caused by a macho uh, and overwhelmingly male uh, business culture in the banking sector and that um, in Iceland after the crisis then uh, women were brought in uh, to do uh, guys who had been heading key banks that had gone bankrupt, gone bust um, they were thrown out and two women were brought in to head the banks and with this idea that they are going to change the culture, uh, injecting values of openness, fairness and social responsibility. So there, there's also been this uh, talk about, uh, it's not just about the, the issues of the numbers of men and women, something you might think of as of the gender division of labour and decision making, it's also about the kind of culture that prevails so that even if uh, women uh, are there, uh, they um, only survive by adapting to this macho culture. And as somebody said uh, uh, in, a, in a seminar we were in Oxford uh, last week, um, somebody has raised the question, challenged this, and said, wasn't it more to do with the kind of financial models that they use to evaluate risk and whether it was men or women there if they use those kind of mathematical models which they uh, thought were telling them that none of this was particularly risky uh, whether they were men or women operating it wouldn't have made much difference uh, but uh, then somebody else argued well maybe if they had been such a macho culture and there'd been more women there there would have been different style of banking um, in, with, without so much um, reliance on these kinds of mathematical models to evaluate risk. And there has been, in, in the discussion of the financial sector more broadly and before the crisis, an issue about whether gendered norms lead to different risk-related uh, behaviours, whether some people have the idea that in financial decision-making uh, maybe uh, women tend to be more risk-averse um, because uh, of uh, various uh, norms about responsibility and about practical issues too, about having to uh, take care of elder relatives or of uh, children. Uh, others argued it's not a matter of gender differences in risk aversion, but in risk awareness, uh, and that uh, women are um, more aware of a greater, a greater um, range of risks and depth of risk and having that, that awareness may, may or may not lead them to be more risk averse. So that was a, a, another angle of an investigation. And I think there are some interesting issues one could look at there, but I think one shouldn't just focus on the issue of the proximate origins of the financial crisis. Of course, I think it has underlying causes I'm particularly going to focus on underlying causes of this particular financial crisis, but in doing so, I do want to make, before I go into that, I want to make the point that, of course, financial crisis and economic recession is not a new thing. It happens every so often. Uh, it goes right back to the beginnings of the capitalist uh, system. The 19th century is punctuated by financial crisis and uh, economic recession. It's the stuff of Victorian novels about 
families losing everything in the financial crisis or the recession coming and hitting Manchester where I lived for many years and uh, provoking uh, labor unrest uh, in response to it. So it's not a new thing. It seems to be hardwired into the way the capitalist economies work. Uh, but what, and, I, and there's a whole, uh, a lot of things one could say about that. Um, what, why is that the case? Um, but I particularly wanted to draw attention to the, this crisis, this crisis which in, in, in post-war crises, of course, is unique in having its origins in the rich countries rather than in lower income countries. And I think it is related to global shifts, you know, global shifts in investment and production, global competition putting global pressure on, downward pressure on wages. So if you look around the world in most regions, the growth of productivity is not matched by the growth of real wages. It is an era um, uh, prior to the crisis of rising female labor market participation around the world. Uh, which, of course, on one hand, we can celebrate as something which is very important for improving women's rights and autonomy, uh, but it's also sobering to think that one of the reasons why this has happened is because average households have needed more than one income to stay above the poverty line. And also, uh, that most women entering into the labour market don't get what I call their breadwinner jobs and wages as kind of shorthand for the sort of good jobs with social protection and a, a, a steady and high level and increasing level of wages that will support several people. And indeed, fewer men have got breadwinner jobs. So we've got that um, situation in which gender gaps in labor markets uh, have been narrowing in terms of things like participation rates and even in, in terms of uh, wage gaps in some countries, um, but in a context in which labor rights for both men and women are under pressure and deteriorating. So that the share of national income going to work has been falling in many um, countries and listing the regions there. From, and consumption growth in high income countries has only been sustained by credit. And I think particularly USA, UK and Ireland, the, the credit card culture with very high levels of household debt, um, which has sustained this and has masked downward trends in median real wages. So I think we have to look at the financial crisis in this deep context, uh, context that's been happening to production and wages. And then i particularly like to explore a little bit uh, further in terms of underlying causes, a link between debt and social reproduction, particularly in the USA, UK and Ireland, and particularly as it uh, relates to housing. I think in all these countries, public housing availability has been falling and home purchases have been expanding and home loans have been expanding. Notice I don't say home ownership has been expanding because I think there's an ideology that what people are getting is home ownership, but actually what they're getting is a lot of debt. Mm -hmm. Most people don't actually own their houses until late on in their lives when they spend 25 years, 30 years paying off a, a debt much more so in the USA, UK and Ireland than I say in Germany and France. I'm not so sure about Spain, I haven't looked at that at all. Um, and we know for a long time uh, before the crisis, house prices were rising, this kind of fictional wealth and itself encouraging growth in uh, consumer debt as people cashed out on some of the equity in their houses to uh, to go on to, to buy consumer durables or pay for health health costs, I guess, in the United States. Um, in the USA, as you all know, the, the subprime loans with these teaser rates, these low rates when you start them off, um, extended to particularly to uh, borrowers who are perceived by uh, the financial community as more risky. Uh, with women household heads and African Americans, and particularly African American women household heads, being overrepresented in the so called subprime loans. And for these loans, access is easier, but the terms are more onerous over the life of the mortgage. So that um, I think from my data here comes some work that Brigitte Young has been putting together on this, and the paper by her I've posted on the, the website of the Haven Center. Um, 
it, it, it starts off easier to repay, but since the interest rates go up over the life of the loan, it takes a lot more to repay than a, a regular loan. And apparently women borrowers in the USA have been more likely to receive subprime loans than men at every income level. So it's not just that women have got lower incomes, and that's the reason why they're disproportionately represented in subprime loans. And I was rem remembering how when we, when I was young, um, we had to fight for women to get, to be able to get mortgages in their own right. And when I was young, uh, you couldn't get a mortgage. Your husband or your father or some man had to sign as the guarantor. And we fought that battle. We got the right to have a, a loan in your own name uh, without a male guarantor. But a um, bit of a pyrrhic victory. Uh, for many women because uh, you were still perceived as a more risky borrower um, and uh, with, with um, uh, uh, not uh, having access to loans on the same terms. Uh, in the UK, we didn't call it the subprime market, but we had uh, what in retrospect was really crazy, lending to people at uh, high percentages of their annual income at um, 105% uh, of the purchase price of a house, and it was all predicated on the idea that house prices would go on rising, and so people would make a capital gain, uh, and uh, also the, the, these, these um, houses, that the, the, the assets on the books of the banks, that the prices of them would uh, carry on uh, rising. But clearly nobody um, who ran the banks really had studied any economic history, uh, because um, uh, history, again, of capitalism is punctuated by asset price bubbles that then collapse. Um, and as this one did. Um, I'm interested in, in exploring, I don't know whether anybody has yet, whether there is a all a link between the rise in the defaults in the subprime market and the uh, fuel and food price rises that started to come in in 2007 um, because because preceding the financial crisis there were rises in fuel and food prices so particularly onerous uh, in lower income countries as I'll say something about tomorrow uh, but a question for me that I haven't seen anybody really investigating yet but I'll be on the lookout for that is whether there's any link between the rise in defaults in the supply market and those uh, rises in fuel and food prices. So, uh, when I'm thinking about the gender dimensions of the financial crisis, I think I want to get beyond um, thinking about is it uh, is it crisis made by men because they're the ones who dominate and their macho culture is the one that dominates the financial sector to think more in terms of the link between social reproduction and high finance, and the way in which social reproduction for so uh, many uh, middle and lower income families become predicated on high levels of debt, uh, both for um, consumer spending and for their housing. And then, um, particularly the housing uh, debt, um, uh, there's a lot of financial innovation um, which of course sounds incredibly positive, but what it meant was uh, slicing and dicing all of these mortgages to create new assets on the back of these mortgages, which were given AAA ratings by the uh, the um, bond, the the, fund, the organisations like Moody, uh, Moody and Standard and Poor's that give ratings to financial instruments because they had a mixture of so-called kind of good mortgages and less good mortgages. And um, by, uh, by 2006, the stability of the financial, international financial system did depend on the ability of low middle income holders of subprime mortgages to service their debt. And this spread way beyond uh, the USA uh, and the UK because of the way that banks uh, were being globalized and they were international markets for these um, derivative financial instruments. So, um, uh, quoted there uh, what James Crotty at UMass Amherst has had to say uh, about this, that um, the, the problems in the housing market and the subprime defaults um, meant that the collapse of the derivative financial instruments based on the mortgages collapsed and 
via the global capital market that had knock-on effects um, or throughout the banking system of the, the, the well-off countries, even the ones like Switzerland and Germany and France that hadn't had the same kind of uh, bubbles in their housing markets and hadn't had quite the same um, kind of predication of social reproduction and high levels of indebtedness, they, they got um, a contagion effect through their banking system. So the risk was offloaded from Wall Street and the City of London to uh, homes uh, throughout the world, but particularly those of middle and low income people. So I think that, that's the way I'd like to see the gender dimensions of the financial crisis to not get beyond and perhaps more superficial look in terms of counting the ones of men and women that were in the room when crucial decisions were taken. Um, in terms of the impact of the crisis, well, in the financial sector, I think you'll know that there was a credit crunch, so loans were not rolled over and credit became very hard to find. Um, I, I think I, do, I haven't seen any research yet or perhaps even look for it on whether there's a gender dimension to that. If you're running a small business and credit becomes a lot, lot harder and your loans aren't rolled over as they were in the past, has that been more difficult for uh, women-owned businesses than for men-owned businesses? Maybe it has if women are perceived as, again, as more risky borrowers. Mm. And similarly, the same would go for ethnic minority borrowers. I think that might be an interesting question. Um, some job loss, of course, as well in the financial sector, um, and has there been uh, a gendered pattern to that? And those are short-run effects, but in the longer run, well, there's been the, the ongoing sort of promise that rules are going to change, we're not going to let this happen again, but as the crisis uh, wears on, I am less and less and less optimistic that there really is going to be any substantial change in the rules. Um, the bonus culture seems to be back. Um, banks that have survived the immediate onslaught not too keen on the rules being changed very much. And although there's quite a, an interesting discussion going on between Anglo-Saxon capitalism and, uh, and uh, social market capitalism on this issue, I, I'm far less optimistic that it's going to be much of a change in the rules or indeed much of a change in the cultural norms of the banking. Uh, system either. Notice that it was only Iceland that's put women in charge of trying to clean up the banks. Um, and uh, I don't see really much uh, sign that women's employment rights in the sector uh, are going to be improving. Let's have a look now about the impact of the crisis in production. Obviously the short run uh, impact because of the credit crunch has been loss of employment and worsening conditions of employment, shorter hours, lower earnings, lower benefits. I understand lower earnings is something that comes close to home here, um, in that although people haven't lost their jobs in the public sector in Wisconsin, there's, uh, there's been a de facto loss of earnings through enforced holidays, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, declining returns in self-employment, um, increase in bankruptcies. In the long run, of course, people have raised the issue, well, it, it would just be an opportunity to then to, to restructure production, to address challenges of climate change, fuel security, food security, and, and the, the care crisis associated with aging population. A lot of question marks there because I, I don't see that happening. Um, and that would be the optimistic scenario that there could be um, opportunity for this. And the pessimistic scenario is it will um, be a restructuring of a different sort with uh, even more onslaught on uh, labour rights and a greater growth of precarious employment than before. But if we look at the gender dimensions of that, and thinking back to my second slide with Ruth Sutherland saying, is this a recession in which uh, women are going to be hit hardest. Um, if we look at the unemployment data, it doesn't bear out her concern, uh, not uh, the data uh, for um, last year. Uh, so last year, um, uh, UK, uh, Jan to October, the, the data from the Office of National Statistics, male unemployment rose from 5.6% to 6.6%. It's a lot higher than that now. Uh, female unemployment rose, it was always a bit lower than men's in the UK, and it's gone up to 5.6%. Uh, 
So, no, the, the answer would be if you looked at the unemployment figures, you would not see it a, a recession in which women in the UK were bearing the job loss uh, more than men. Um, but at the end of this data, the, the, it showed that the rate of increase of unemployment for women was approaching that of men. And uh, the le a new report from the Trade Union and the Congress, which I haven't yet had time to look at, suggests that uh, the recession has spread to new sectors of the economy. It's spread beyond construction and the car industry and is having a significant impact on the retail sector in which lots of women work. So, um, by the, and, and for reasons I'll come on to later, um, next year we're expecting there to be declines in public sector employment, and so with this pack, this might turn out to be a short-run impact that might look somewhat different uh, by the middle or the end of next year. I was looking at an ILO report that was uh, looking at um, data from several of the rich countries, including the USA, that's why my data there is from the ILO, and that seemed to suggest that the, the UK picture uh, for last year was uh, pretty much similar in many of the other rich countries. Um, so the data for the, the USA was that male unemployment rose by 1.7 percentage points to reach nearly 8%, and female unemployment rose by 1.1 percentage points to reach nearly 6.5%. With, of course, the key reason being that the sectors that were hardest hit are the ones that tend to employ more men uh, than women, construction in particular. Um, but uh, just two problems to note. There, there, there are um, there is an issue that women's unemployment is more likely to be undercounted than men's. Um, discouraged worker effect is often stronger for women. Um, and time frame matters. It may be that the, the early impact is on the more male intensive industries, but the later impact uh, will come on more female intensive service industries. Uh, but I think we'd have to say you can't make a simple argument that the uh, recession is. Um, having more impact on women's jobs than men's. If you look not at unemployment but at uh, job loss, which is another uh, indicator, and that it, it means that you don't have to worry about that discouraged worker effect, uh, this is um, some data that uh, the Trade Union Congress in the um, UK was quoting in a report it issued in January 2009 on male and female redundancy rates from 1997 to 2008. And the blue line is male and the red line is female. And you can see it's been higher uh, for men than women, reflecting the higher unemployment rates in the UK for men and women. It's been on a downward trend since uh, the, the uh, recovery from the uh, uh, recession of the early 2000s. Uh, but of course, it goes up in 2008, but it goes up at a, a higher rate for women than for men. So although um, the, the, it starts off at a lower level for women, the gap is narrowing, and um, in January to September 2008, female rates increase at double the rate for men. But beyond um, crunch, looking at the numbers, looking at the gender divisions in terms of dis sex disaggregation of statistics on different dimensions of employment and unemployment, I think it's important to look at gender norms uh, in employment. There's certainly um, a possibility of discrimination, illegal discrimination against women in selection for redundancy. Uh, it is illegal, for instance, in the UK, but there are reports that uh, employers are putting uh, pressure on pregnant women and women on maternity leave. Um, they're being selected for redundancy, bullied into resigning, um, given uh, downgraded jobs that uh, they try and return for maternity leave, for instance, being told, no, no, you can't come back on a part-time basis, even though that had been agreed before. You can't come back with family-friendly employment conditions, even though that had been agreed before. And the with this view that if it's a recession, really it's men that should have priority in the employment, and that pregnant and women and uh, women on maternity leave, um, their rights take second place. And um, I wondered whether, in fact, the recession might strengthen these kinds of gendered norms. There was a question in the World Value Survey in 2005 
about asking what, when people, when jobs were scarce, did they think that, did they agree that men have more right to a job than women when jobs are scarce? And 40% of those interviewed agreed. Um, seems to me that might be the kind of gender norm that's going to be um, reinforced, intensified um, in, in the kind of recession we've got. <coughs> Um, there's also an issue about gendered rights. I don't know what it's like in the USA, but in the UK, women are less likely than men to qualify for unemployment benefits. Uh, for some, it's because they earn, when they were in employment, less than the threshold for compulsory contributions to social insurance, which is a condition for access to unemployment benefits, not access to the sort of base of basic income benefits, but access to unemployment benefits. So women who work part-time, lots of women work part-time in the UK, might not, especially if they were older women, have made the contributions that entitle them to unemployment benefit. Uh, but another is because um, after the first six months of, of um, social insurance-based benefit, you move on to a different kind of benefit, which is a means-tested benefit rather than a social insurance-based benefit. And it's means-tested on household, not individual income. And uh, in, the, in the UK, it turns out that uh, unemployed women are more likely to have an unemployed partner uh, than unemployed men are. And so they wouldn't be likely to be qualified. Uh, so women, for those kinds of reasons, are less well-placed to, to withstand, they get less cushion from the uh, unemployment benefits. And of course, we don't have nearly as good unemployment benefits in the UK as they do in countries like Germany or France. Let me turn now to the negative impact on social reproduction. I think it's obvious in the short run that there's a decline in household incomes for many people. There's an increase in repossessions of homes. Uh, there's a decline in asset values. The house has gone down. The pension value has gone down. I know that's a big issue here because you have these pensions which are defined contribution pensions rather than defined benefit pensions. Um, decline in interest on savings of uh, older people and retirees. So pressure on uh, income and asset values. Uh, leading again in the longer run to um, probably uh, declines in what economists like to call social uh, and human capital, I suppose financial capital. In other words, declines in health, uh, declines in educational achievements, um, people dropping out of uh, school at all levels, uh, declines in health, uh, the pressure on mental health, the pressure on here, I think. Uh, although not in the UK, of losing your health insurance and then not seeking treatment until it's uh, too late. Uh, even in the UK, where, um, despite what you may have heard um, on these uh, right-wing talk shows, <laughs> everybody has the, uh, uh, the access to the National Health Service, which is actually in much better shape now than it was 10 years ago. Um, there will the, the declines in, in uh, mental health, uh, I think, are already starting to show. And I think, especially, you would expect to see this in most deprived social groups. But I don't know whether in rich countries like the UK or the USA, you would expect to see any gender differences there. We'll come tomorrow to some of these longer run um, impacts in the poorer countries where you would expect to see, based on past evidence, gender differences in things like educational dropout or a decline in um, access to healthcare. Um, I'm interested in what people think about that, um, but I'm not aware um, that, uh, there, that there's likely to be a gender difference there. I think the class and the uh, race, ethnicity difference is probably likely to be stronger. How do households respond? So I now want to start talking about from impact to responses and talk about a little bit about, first about household responses. Um, I think one response one tends to see is back to thrift, um, reduce consumption, increase savings, increase unpaid, unpaid work. And I'll be saying a little bit more about the, uh, the issue of, uh, of unpaid work when I try and pick out some of the uh, gender um, divisions. But um, make do and mend. Um, uh, 
make food at home rather than uh, go to the restaurant, um, make food at home rather than buy in fast food, um, grow your own vegetables, <laughs> cutting sleep, and that has uh, impacts on the uh, uh, mental health. Now all of these reactions, all of these responses, these thrifty responses may help individuals and individual families survive, although that's not guaranteed because there's a limit to what you can do uh, to the, through, through these measures to uh, survive. Um, but um, at my thrift contributes to a downward spiral in your paid economic activity. I think this is what Keynes uh, emphasizes, the paradox of thrift. Uh, my response to the crisis is going to be thrifty, but that's going to put you out of a job. If, if you've already got a job, you'll be out of a job because I will spend less on dry cleaning, I will spend less on fast food, I will spend less on going uh, out to the restaurant. I'll expand my unpaid work uh, and uh, try and keep up the well-being of my family through doing more unpaid work, but that'll tend to put a lot of other people out of jobs. Uh, and so the paradox of thrift is that individual thrift is actually, it looks like a survival strategy for the people that do it, but it deepens the recession, spreads the recession wider. So can this be counteracted? And in my view, it needs collective action to do that. Some of, some of that can take place at a local level, where an um, institution of uh, local uh, economic uh, trading systems using local currencies or time banks may help. Um, the, so I don't need money. Um, I will swap uh, an hour of time painting your walls for an hour of your time um, baking some bread. Um, at the local level. But there's a lot of limits to what you can achieve by doing that. Um, it, I've been to Ithaca, so I know the nice Ithaca <laughs> hour system, and uh, I know, you know the, the good side of that, but actually I doubt if Ithaca hours is able to protect Ithaca fully from the onslaught of the recession. Um, so you need national level uh, uh, responses, and I think it's absolutely essential that you need state action to uh, expand aggregate demand. In those thrifty responses, there there is a definite uh, gender divisions, I think, because of gender norms. Um, it would be very often evidence in some previous crises that women re reduce consumption more than men in terms of cutting their own uh, meals, especially in order to preserve the, the meals and the food quality of the food they give to their children. I've seen evidence of that in Canada, for instance, in previous crises, more localized ones to do with restructuring. Men may increase consumption of goods like alcohol because when men lose their jobs, there's arguably a greater demoralization effect for many men than for women, and, and alcohol consumption may go up. Uh, some countries, it appears that women have a higher propensity to save than men. The Japanese. Uh, Crisis. The Japanese lost a case is partly to do with the thriftiness of Japanese women who manage the household money and have very, very high savings rates. Unpaid <coughs> work, I think. The evidence tends to suggest from timely surveys that women still do more of the unpaid work uh, uh, on average than men, and it's then that's likely to be uh, extending the average, uh, on average, the amount of unpaid work. But there are difficulties in monitoring this. We, I could quote you those statistics about unemployment and job loss. I can't quote you any statistics on uh, what's been happening to unpaid work in this thrifty response. Um, the difficulties in rapid monitoring of that. And you in the US, I think, had got one of the most regular time use surveys in the world. Is it every, every year you've had a time use survey? In most countries, only every five years. But I gather this has been under threat. And there's, I don't know whether it's been acted upon, but a threat to, it's too expensive to economize and time you survey, what's the use of that? It's not like the um, financial statistics are really important for the financial sector and the, and the market-based production sector, so let's cut the time use surveys. I think that would be very much a false economy right now because through those time use surveys you may get some sense of uh, what's happening to unpaid work in the thrifty response. 
Uh, but another idea is to look at the mirror image of that thrifty response in terms of consumption on labour-saving inputs like ready meals and dry cleaning. And I'm hoping to do uh, some work on that um, later this year or the next year with a colleague in the sociology department at Essex using um, consumption data from the um, UK surveys that are much that are quarterly, so you can see uh, more rapidly what the changes might be. And there are these gender norms that are very important in, in structuring the, th the thrifty responses because despite all of this rise in female participation in the labour market and narrowing some of the gaps in the labour market, a lot of the evidence seems to suggest that women still have a, a, a thought to have. There's a norm that women uh, have more responsibility than men for that thrifty response in sort of making ends meet, coping, and caring. Um, and uh, those those norms about female homemakers and male breadwinners may get strengthened. I mean, one idea I had, which uh, any graduate student who's you know likes likes to do. Uh, content analysis of the media might have a look at, you know, have we got an increase in these articles instructing women about how to knit winter sweaters and produce home grown vegetables, uh, rediscovering the virtues of uh, unpaid work. On the other hand, it's possible, and I don't want to rule this out um, by assumption, that the pressures of the crisis may um, start to uh, sort of shape a bit and maybe undermine the strength of that gender norm. I was in Ireland at the end of uh, August talking with people there about what's been happening, the crisis there. Hi Ireland's been very hard hit. Um, and uh, there, uh, in terms of job loss, lots of the job loss so, so far has been mainly private sector, not public sector, where that, that may not continue. And it's been more uh, men that have lost their jobs than women, just like the UK and the USA so far. Uh, and their people were telling me of, uh, in, in middle class uh, families, some sort of shifting of those gender norms where men who had lost their jobs or hadn't so much work if they were self-employed, taking on much uh, more central role in childcare and in the, doing the cooking and the shopping and all of that. Uh, so it's possible, I mean, that's the sort of optimistic scenario that the pressure of the crisis uh, brings about some kinds of changes in those gender norms. Uh, but otherwise what you might get is enforced idleness for men uh, and overwork for women. Uh, and I think we still don't really know what the balance of that is going to be. So what about the responses from the point of view of the states? Well, as we know, the short-run response was bailing out the banks and socialising the losses, taking some banks and some assets into public ownership, but only as a temporary measure. Uh, this is one of the huge lost opportunities of the crisis in the UK. A huge chunk of the banking sector is now in public ownership. So has that made any difference to the way the banks operate? No because the government has deliberately run it uh, as an arm's length way, it's put people from the financial sector in charge of it, it's nominally owned, but the control is not exerted uh, in, a, in a way that um, makes the banks operate in a more socially useful manner. So we've still got the problem that the banks are not lending more to people, even though uh, the Bank of England is pumping money uh, into the economy like never before. It's just most of it just sitting then in the accounts of the banks, even the publicly owned banks. Um, there's also been this uh, short run response of a, a fiscal stimulus, both, both here and in, in the UK, many European countries. Um, but um, to preserve existing types of private sector jobs, particularly with a focus on cars and roads, I mean, it's amazing, you know, country after country after country, and even, you know, despite the differences between Anglo-Saxon capitalism and social market capitalism, it still turns out to be roads and cars that's at the centre of the, the fiscal stimulus uh, packages. Um, so that, that, that idea is about some long-run uh, restructuring, some opportunity for a green uh, stimulus and to prepare economies to address those longer run crises of climate change, for instance, seems to be lost. 
in the long run, we're still, uh, there's still this discussion about improving the regulation of the financial sector nationally and internationally. And lots of question marks there. You get your good days when you read in the Financial Times that the, uh, the um, chair of the Financial Services Authority in the UK has uh, castigated banks for not being socially useful, undertaking too many things that were not socially useful and proposing international taxes on banks. You get your bad days um, when you see uh, the resistance that there is to any kinds of regulation beyond uh, really changing uh, capital reserve ratios, which try to make banks a little bit more secure, but really don't radically change the banking culture. But what we are seeing now in the UK and Ireland is this transmogrification of um, what began as a banking crisis in the private sector to a public uh, sector crisis and growing emphasis on cutting public expenditure to reduce public sector debt. So from being a private sector debt crisis, it's been both discursively um, um, and by um, economists, I think, and by political parties transformed into a public debt crisis. I'd be interested to know whether it's the same here. Yeah. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in my final slide. So just in terms of the fiscal, going back to the fiscal stimulus, the roads and cars, um, there was quite a lively discussion here among feminist economists. So I, I, mean, I count myself as a feminist economist. I, I am housed in a very pluralistic uh, sociology department. Um, so this is a comment that one of the uh, leading feminist economists um, in the USA, in the Boston University, her comments on the, uh, the first uh, the, the the stimulus package that was introduced in the USA, arguing that it was a macro stimulus package in the sense that it was particularly directed to the the, the uh, sectors of the economy, roads and cars. Um, which, which employ, uh, disproportionately employ men rather than women. And then there was discussion about whether the fiscal stimulus could, could be used, though, as a lever to change gender norms. So uh, there was a group of US feminist economists who wrote this open letter to President Obama about uh, whether some kind of affirmative action could be built into the fiscal stimulus uh, so that... Um, uh, for uh, the share of for jobs going to women and to minority groups, it could be monitored, there might be some conditions about that, uh, to try and get more uh, women and, and people from uh, ethnic minorities into those um, sectors, building roads and bridges and cars and so forth, as, as one kind of uh, response to that. But I think now, I think that was like, well, that was last year's discussion. Certainly in the UK and Ireland, this year's discussion is how have we got from fiscal stimulus to public expenditure cutbacks. In Ireland, they already started having serious public expenditure uh, cutbacks. Um, this would disproportionately reduce the jobs and earnings of women because uh, women are relatively more concentrated in public sector jobs. It would disproportionately impoverish women through reductions in welfare benefits. It will disproportionately increase women's unpaid work through reductions in public services, and it will increase rather than reduce the insecurity of daily life. Uh, and I think we've really got a lost, we've lost an opportunity to challenge, and or at least in my pessimistic moments, I feel we have lost the opportunity that we seemed to have a year ago to challenge and change poverty-driven economic growth. Uh, and, and to argue for ways of uh, organizing our economies that would have been more critical for everybody. And certainly in the UK, we, we were all preparing for a struggle to defend the kind of public expenditure that's critical for gender equality and improvements in the lives of poor women. And it's the same in Ireland. Of course, we could do a lot to say that if we've got to have public expenditure cutbacks in the UK, uh, Bring troops home from Afghanistan would uh, go a long way <laughs> to making the kind of cuts that are needed, but don't hold breath mm -hmm. that this will be uh, the response that's made. And I think for me, this is one of the sort of big uh, puzzles and issues. How did that happen? Could we have done anything about it? 
And I don't know whether you in the UK, USA are facing the same problem, because I know you have that difference between what happens at the federal level, where you can run, you know, seem to be able to run any, any budget deficit you care to mention, so long as Chinese carry on buying the US treasury bonds. But at state level, I understand there's a different game, where there's lots of states have got balanced budget legislation, and you've got that paradox of deficits running up at federal level, again, a lot of it going in uh, war and arms-related expenditure, but at the at state level, cuts in, in the public services and employment. So my last slide then, by way of, sort of preliminary conclusions, this is an early stage, but I think it's clear that both men and women are armed by the crisis, but in ways that dis depend on these intersections, and, gender, class, race, ethnicity, age, location. I've said nothing about age, but young people are being very, very hard hit. And anybody over 50 who lose their jobs being hard hit. Um, and I think it's too simplistic. It makes nice journalistic headlines to argue it's a, a crisis made by men with women hardest hit. Um, but I, nevertheless, I think there's a sense in which women, more than men, are expected to shoulder the burdens of coping, uh, trying to cope and of uh, caring um, and of expanding their unpaid work to try and cope with the crisis. But those individual uh, caring and coping strategies deepen the recession. So you, you have to have collective responses. And there was some initial, initial um, grounds for optimism that um, governments had rediscovered Keynesian economics and we're all convinced that an expansionary response uh, was required. Uh, but that, I think, has been short-lived and there's already the uh, cuts in public expenditure and big preparations to do so. And I think it's this more than anything, this transmogrification from the crisis being a crisis of financial crisis, of private sector debt to we are told um, a crisis of public sector debt that means public expenditure has to be cut. And that, it's through that mechanism that the full cost of the crisis, I think, are being offloaded uh, from the boardrooms and the trading floors to the kitchens, and where um, women, in, women, I think, a bit more so than men, given the strength of those gender norms, will, will be having to figure out how they pick up the pieces for their families. <laughs>